Hello and welcome to Gearheads. My name's Jesse and today we're going to be talking about how and why would you put a wideband O2 sensor into your vehicle. In my case it's going to be my Miata. So first things first, why would you want to have a wideband O2 sensor and why do you need it if you want to start tuning your car, if you want to boost it, or even if you're trying to tune it naturally aspirated. It's still a very important tool. So your oxygen sensors basically tell you exactly how rich or lean your engine is running and that's a very important piece of information when you're tuning the vehicle, especially when you boost it and you're making more power because uh, when you start increasing your power and increasing the pressure in those cylinders, you want to get even more accurate and closer to making sure your, your fuel ratio is perfect so that you don't run too lean and blow the thing up or melt a piston or you know melt your valves. You also don't want to run too rich either. You're going to be losing power that way and you could potentially hurt some other things too if you're running way too rich. Uh, either way though. That is pretty much why you would want to do this. Uh, my car, obviously, we're going to be doing a turbo on it. And um, before we get further in the video, I will tell you also, I already have it in the car. So I will show it to you and make some explanations for stuff. I did a video, or uh, I made a video uh, showing how to install it like seven months ago or something like that. And this was back when the channel was kind of on a break. I was so out of practice and that video was terrible and clunky. So. Bear with me while I kind of redo that and what I'll do is show, uh, I will show footage from when I did install it because I still have it and uh, give you a better idea of how things actually go together and go in there. Otherwise, uh, if you have any questions about more reasons why you want to have a wideband O2, if you're putting a Mega Squirt, a Speedwino or Haltech or anything like that in your car, you need to have a good sensor to talk to that thing so you can make adjustments to your tune and see you know what's going on and your tuner is going to want it too if you're getting your car built and all done or whatever and then you take it to a tuner on a dyno and they're going to tune the thing they're going to want to be able to see that information as well it's a very critical important thing so hopefully that answers any questions you have for for why and now let's get on more to the how and what is out there so the two biggest like names as far as wideband o2 sensors are concerned are going to be uh, the aem and the Innovate. So I have actually heard some things more recently about the Innovate gauges and, and uh, their controllers going bad, not lasting quite as long versus the AEM ones seem to have a bit better reputation. I will say though, personally I do actually have the Innovate one right now and I've had it for a long time but the truth is my car hasn't had that many miles on it so it's not like it's gotten that much actual use even though it's probably five, six years old now. But uh, it's been working for me and it worked very well so far. So anyway, uh, that's really going to be up to you whether you, you know, which company you go with. But the install process is pretty much going to be the same either way. So the first thing you're going to want to do is replace your stock O2 sensor. So there's two different ways you can really go about this. If you're not going to be putting a mega squirt in the car, you can replace the factory sensor and then the wideband has two outputs actually for, as options. It has a narrow band signal output. So if you want to still keep the stock computer, but you're still, you know, you're putting the wideband in for tuning purposes and uh, keep an eye on things, you can still replace the stock sensor with it. Another option, if you want to keep the stock computer for some reason, is um, you can hook the thing up and basically wire the signal wires from the sensor itself to nothing. You just leave your stock sensor in its place. You can weld a bung into the exhaust for the wideband and it will come up to the gauge still for you and give you the data there. But off the back of the gauge, there's two wires, a brown wire and a yellow wire. And the brown wire is going to give you the narrow band signal, if that's what you're after. And the yellow wire will give you the wide band si uh, signal. So right now, as it's installed in my car, I have, uh, you've got the black and red wires coming off the back. Those are going to be just for your power. Um, and then there's a white wire there too for illumination so that you can have a dimming option. And then on top of that, like I said before, the yellow and brown wire. So currently, since it's already in my car, I have the brown wire wired in and it goes through the firewall back out and I have it actually plugged into the factory O2 sensor um, part of the harness that sits on the back of the head. So I'll make sure I show you right now in some video overlay where that is. Well, maybe before I get into showing the overlay and how, I'll just keep explaining this first. So that 
That is the critical things you need though. You want to replace or find out how you're going to install the sensor itself and then the sensor's got a nice big cable coming off of it and I like to pull it through the firewall. There's a couple options. You could either drill a hole and then uh, run, run the wire through put a grommet in to seal that hole up or you could uh, run it through a, a hole that's already there. I think actually I went through the speedometer cable hole and um, because, let me think, that or I went through where the cruise control used to go through the firewall. But either way, there is places there already you can run that wire through and then you're gonna have a little control box and you're gonna wanna mount that under the dash somewhere and then that is what is gonna actually plug into the gauge that you see. And then off the back of the gauge is where the signal wires come in and where you put your power and ground for it. So another thing to discuss now is okay, where do you want to get your power and your ground from? Uh, some people will argue and say that you want to ground that exactly where the, the factory PCM or if you put an aftermarket computer in, you want to ground it in the exact same place that that is ground. That's a great idea and not a bad thing to do. Currently, mine is actually just wired into the cigarette lighter. I like that option because the truth is the heater for the O2 sensor because the wideband does have a heater in it. Um, that's going to pull a little bit of current and it's nice to have it on, I mean, it's the best way to do it, put it on a protected circuit, but I picked the, uh, I picked the circuit that's for the cigarette lighter because that already has, uh, what I think it's a 15 amp fuse on it, and that itself is a heater too. So that circuit can supply the voltage needed to run the wideband without any problems. Um, as far as grounds go, it grounds to the whole car. You know, when you're getting into really accurate engine data, if you want to be super precise, yes, uh, it is the best thing to do to ground it exactly where the computer is going to be ground. Uh, when I do eventually get the mega squirt in here, maybe I will run an extra wire and ground them together. But right now, it's working fine for me. And anyway, I just want to give you guys an idea of uh, how I did it. There's other ways you can do it too, other things you could wire in. But definitely don't try and wire it into a constant power. You want this thing to be on a switched power that comes on and off with the key. Um, and you also don't want to be, when you have a wideband in there, you don't really want to be turning it on and just leaving the key on all the time for too long because that wideband gets hot and uh, the truth is that ironically, the exhaust and fuel going through the exhaust kind of cool it down. You don't want it to get too hot. So just keep that in mind. You want to be safe how you wire the thing up, and hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, you know how I, I did it and what's worked for me. Uh, so let's go over the actual install process now. So I'll probably be overlaying this video uh, with footage of how I did it. So uh, obviously pop your hood, look down to the right, and you should see your stock O2 sensor. If you're going to be replacing that one like I did, then uh, get a 22 millimeter wrench, or if you want, just go buy an O2 sensor uh, wrench tool that you can put on a ratchet. That makes it a lot easier sometimes to remove them because if it's been in there a long time and it's rusty, it can be a real pain in the butt to try and bust that thing loose. And with a normal wrench, you might have a tough time. So just letting you know that option is out there. So first, remove that, and then the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is install your new sensor. Make sure you put some anti-seize on the threads of the wideband. I don't remember if they come with it on there already uh, new, but if there is no anti-seize on them, put some anti-seize on the threads, thread that new one in, install it. So once the wideband sensor is actually physically installed into the pipe, you're going to have a short harness that comes off of it, and that's going to what, that is what is going to plug into the control box for the sensor itself and for the gauge. Uh, figure out where that's going to go. So the box is the part, there's the brain. That's what's actually going to control the sensor itself, and then that's what talks to the gauge and gives you your... Uh, you know, gives you your actual ratios and, and it controls how it sends, you know, whether you're sending the narrow band or the wide band signal. Anyway, that control box is going to sit uh, wherever you really want it. I find the best spot, honestly, is over, to zip tie it up on the side uh, in the fender well, firewall area, uh, kind of underneath the, the master cylinder um, or the clutch master cylinder. That's pretty much where I've always put them and just find a spot down there to zip tie it and it can hang out. So then, once that's plugged in, you're going to want to run the wire through the firewall that's going to go up to the gauge. So you're going to have to go from the engine bay back, like I said before, find a grommet, uh, find a hole that's already there or something, and uh, run it through. And then if you want to seal that up, you can find a grommet to do so. Or you can always use some silicone, uh, like RTV, to seal the hole. And if you do need to pull it out later, it's not a big deal. You can just cut the RTV, pull the thing out. But anyway, at least it keeps it sealed so you're not getting random fumes and stuff coming through your firewall into the cabin. 
So now that you've got the wire coming through uh, onto the inside part of the firewall, you're going to have to get down on your back, pull the wires all the way through, and uh, now you're going to have to make a decision of where you're going to want to put your gauge because what this is going to do, that wire is going to plug uh, into the harness that comes off of the actual gauge itself. Uh, I've opted to put mine up in the A pillar area. Uh, some people like to put them in the vents, some people like to put them on top of the dash. Uh, there's a lot of options for that and I will be doing a video showing how I mount it. The thing is, mine's actually not mounted yet, but I will be doing a video on how to mount it and how I'm mounting it uh, because I'm also going to wire in and install a boost gauge as well, a vacuum and boost gauge. So I'll be installing them together and mounting them together and that's why it's not actually mounted in the A pillar yet. But either way, the next thing there is figure out where you're going to put it. And the truth is, plan this out ahead of time. Don't figure it out while you're installing it. Think about it, and you should have it figured out, and you should know what you're going to be doing. So anyway, uh, once you have that decision made of where the thing's going to mount, run your wires through. You're going to have some extra slack from that long, uh, the long black cable that comes from the uh, wideband controller. And uh, roll it up, zip tie the slack away somewhere up in under the dash so it's not dragging on your feet and uh, getting in the way of the pedals. That's not a good thing. You don't want that. And then let me think. Uh, after that, you're going to want to, I guess, wire in the sensor. When you wire in the gauge, it's supplying the power and the ground for the module and the sensor itself. So you're kind of starting out with the sensor, going all the way up to the gauge then that gets wired in. So find where you want to put your power and ground. Like I said, I did it on the back of the cigarette lighter and I can tell you it is kind of a pain to get up there and reach it. But um, if I found if you pull off that little light that sits right underneath the uh, where the cigarette lighter is, it gives you a little more room and you can see up there. So then what I did is I unplugged the cigarette lighter harness pulled it back and it, I did have enough room if you pull that little panel that's under the steering wheel out also. Um, with that uninstalled and with the thing unplugged, there was enough room for me to cut and splice in uh, the wideband wires to share the ground and power with it. So um, you also, you could solder it or you can use butt connectors. If you do use butt connectors, make sure you use quality ones. Don't use cheapy ones. You don't want this thing, you know, having wiring issues later and having the gauge crap it out and then you think it's okay and it's, you know, you assume the wiring's okay so you start thinking something's wrong with the sensor or something. It's not worth it. Use good butt crimp connectors and also a good pair of crimps to uh, crimp them down. And then uh, if, if you're using, depending on the type you're using, make sure you either use some heat shrink over them or electrical tape them or whatever. So that's going to be up to you. This is your project. This is, this is what you're doing with your car. You decide how you want to do it, but I'm just trying to give you at least advice and ideas. And once you have the power and ground wired in for the uh, wideband, the next thing you got to figure out is your signal wire. So I talked a little before about it has the yellow and brown wires. The brown wire is a narrow band signal. The yellow band is a wide band signal. Uh, right now, mine is currently hooked up on the brown wire. When I put the Mega Squirt in the car, I'm literally just going to change it over to the yellow wire. And the reason for that is, so this is the next step that you're going to be doing. You pick which signal wire you need depending on what computer you have in the car. And what I personally liked to do was when I took the old O2 sensor out, I just cut uh, cut the wire on the top of it. The nice thing about the 9093 cars is it is just a single wire uh, going to that O2 sensor. So I just cut it um, off. I take the sensor off. I just cut it. If you really needed to, you can crimp it and put it back on and use it again later. But for me, just cut that wire. I, I spliced that wire onto a wire coming back through the firewall. So this is where you picked whether you're using the brown wire or the yellow wire. Run a wire from that out and then I crimped it onto the stock connector and uh, just plug that into the factory harness which is on the back of the head. Um, if you're doing this on an OBD2 car, it's probably gonna be a four wire plug. Uh, just gonna need to look up a wiring diagram if I can. I'll make sure I put one on the video here for you. But just find out which one of those wires is the signal wire and that is the wire you're going to want to uh, splice into. Now, like you could do the same thing. You could cut the factory harness and then only splice into the signal wire and just tape the other ones up that go to the ECU or go into the factory harness. Either way, uh, that's also going to be up to you. All right, so this is somewhat wired in. I would like to stress that this is temporary. This is not permanent. 
I will set this up here for the moment in the steering wheel. Um, but I ran a power wire and a ground wire from the cigarette lighter. Um, and then this is my signal wire. This is plugged into the brown wire from the, the, uh, the wideband gauge there. Um, I will be using the yellow wire when I get the mega squirt. So that's as easy as swapping from using the brown one, which I had previously cut super short. And to, you know, I could always cut this open and get to it if I needed to. But I cut it short because of my old car, I never used it. Anyway, I will switch to this when I get the mega squirt in there. But for the moment, I just want to go ahead and, oh, and then by the way, this guy too. This is actually the plug that goes to the sensor from the gauge. So for the moment, like I said, this is all temporary. That was just, it's just kind of running through there for the moment. Um, oh, I want to just start the car. While I'll turn the key on, I'll let this thing kind of turn on and calibrate itself. Um, and then I'll go ahead and start the car. If the check engine light doesn't go off and it's running pretty smoothly, uh, along with throttle inputs and stuff, I can assume that this, the gauge and the sensor is actually working, sending that brown wire signal to the computer. Um, by the way, I used uh, spade connectors from the ground and positive for this, and the reason I did that is because if I want to run anything else up here, like for example the boost gauge with a power, now oh, come on. Anyway, I use spade connectors so I can go ahead and just unplug and plug these in as needed and they're shielded ones so they won't ground out on each other. When this is finally installed, I will use electrical tape just to completely seal it. But for the moment, they ain't gonna ground out on each other if they happen to bump into each other. So let's go ahead and turn the key on, see if this thing comes on and see if the car runs smooth. All right, moment of truth. Well, look at that, power's on. Heater, that's what the HDR means. It's heating up because it's a heated O2 sensor. All right, Oop, but I keep going a second. As soon as that's done, uh, I'll go ahead and start the car. You don't have to do this every time, but I literally haven't used this thing in a long time. I just want to see the process, make sure it goes through because I think it will put out an error code if something's not right. Oh, there you go, look at that. It's reading. Might be a little bright to see on the camera, but it's reading 21 AFR right now. So let's see. Ooh. Oh, it's gonna go, I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot that it shuts off when you crank it, but it went through the heater cycle again, and now it is at 11, oh man, that is really rich. Although my car, it might be in warm-up enrichment, I would assume. Yeah, the coolant temp's pretty low right now. All right, so the car's been running a few minutes now. It's still not warmed up all the way, but it has come up to uh, closer to stoichiometric. You can see it's kind of bouncing up to 15, down to low 14s, back up to 15s, and down to low 14s. It's really aiming for a 14.7 air to fuel ratio. Now, uh, for me, this is good news because that means that it's actually reading. Awesome, and also my check engine light's not on. That's just my brake light. It would pretty much set a code immediately if I had the oxygen sensor unplugged. So what this is telling me is that everything is working properly. So I'm very happy to see that. Now, like I stressed before, this is completely ugly and awful and temporary. And I will be doing another video on mounting the gauges up here. I hope you guys found this video helpful. I'm sorry I'm not actually doing the project in front of you right now, but I hope that the, uh, that the footage I have helps and helps go along with the explanation. And I hope that you learned something. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below. Uh, I always do my best to get back to you guys if I can. So yeah, pardon me if also if this one was a little bit rough, I'm going completely off memory because I'm not explaining it as I'm installing it. It's kind of funny, it's actually a lot harder to think through the whole process when it's not sitting there right in front of you. But either way, hopefully my memory was good enough. And uh, if I missed something, also definitely share it down there because, uh, you know, look at the comments. If you have questions, ask me, but also look down there. A lot of times people share some extra helpful info and things that I didn't, you know, didn't mention or I forgot or sometimes that I didn't know as well. And that's always nice. We always like to learn. So thank you to all of you for participating and uh, for watching as we all go through this journey and project together with my car. So this is the next step. Finally, we're getting things moving and uh, hopefully in the next week I'll be putting the, um, the boost gauge in and we'll do a video on that and then the mega squirt after that and also the uh, gauge install with the pillar. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Hit the like button if you did and uh, hit the subscribe button if you wanna see more videos like this. And as always, keep wrenching.